Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. So I'm excited today to be joined by Tony Copeland Parker, or is it Parker Copeland? I should Copeland have Parker. Up. Copeland Parker. I should have yes. warned you I'm terrible with names. He is the author of the brand new book, Running Around the World, and it's the story of he and Catherine and their journey with her early onset Alzheimer's. So thank you for joining me, Tony. You're quite welcome. It's a pleasure. So tell us a little bit of your story. You were a pilot for UPS, which happens to be my favorite shipping company. <laughs> That's and great. You guys went through some uh, challenges that changed the course of your life. That's a true statement. I was at UPS for 27 years and in the prime of my career there. Unfortunately, I had a leaky aortic valve that I found out about 2012. And shortly thereafter, I decided to have an operation. So I had open heart surgery in 2014. And around about the same time, Catherine was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. So we had those two things happen simultaneously almost. And we are both endorse athletes. We run mostly marathons and half marathons and have done trips to uh, other parts of the world. And we decided that we're just going to go and uh, continue doing our passion, which is running, and to uh, travel. And so as opposed to what people normally do is to settle down and they leave their loved one at home and they continue their career and try to make the best of it. We decided to, to take a team effort and both of us retired. I was able to get her disability. She was working for the uh, government at the time. And also through Social Security, we got her on disability. And then I retired for United Parcel Service where I was a manager pilot and got a you know, my pension. And we had a couple of races on the schedule. We decided where we were going to put a house in the market. Our house sold right away. And now we had some suitcases and some trips scheduled. And we thought maybe we'll find someplace else to live. And we set forth and that was six years ago. And we're still in our suitcases and we're still traveling and we find it actually to be very beneficial to her. And how old was Catherine when she was diagnosed? 53 years old. Yikes. I'm 54, so that's a that's a scary that's a yes, scary it, age. Yes, it that's is. Really early onset. Well, I mean, I do know that there are people in their 30s and 40s, but right. generally early onset Alzheimer's, the people that I know, late 50s, early 60s. So That's correct. And then, so you guys are bucking the trend. Normally, as we discussed, people are told that it's best to keep their routine the same from day to day, week to week, which we've learned how important that was last year when everybody's day-to-day -day routines got blown to smithereens, especially those people taking care of loved ones at home. But that's not what you guys have been doing. So I'm really... When I was reading the book, I was really fascinated what, um, like, I was describing it like if I woke up in a different country every few days, it would be normal to wake up and go, what the heck country am I in again? And I actually did that when we went to Canada way back in 2018. I, we were so late getting in that it... You know, and it's a three-hour time difference from where we're at. And it was just like, I woke up going, where the hell am I? Oh, yeah, we're in Toronto. What time is it? Ugh. And it was just like complete brain fog for, you know, maybe 30 seconds before I fully woke up. And I was describing it. I'm like, if that's normal for those of us that don't have cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's, I'm thinking that it might not be that big a deal for people who do. It just would be the norm instead of, I'm confused, even though my routine is all the same. I hope that makes sense. I it digress does. slightly. <laughs> it does. And from our standpoint, what the research that I had done, there's a couple of things you need to pay attention to. One is to have an experience that will go into long-term memory. 
So, for example, if you're at home and you get up and you go to the refrigerator and you get something and then you come back, it's the same thing that you did yesterday. So it's going to short-term memory, and that's where Alzheimer's first hits. So if you get up and now you're going to tour in London and you see the London Bridge, that's going to the long-term memory, and that is something that you can hold on to for a longer period of time. So in contrast, now you're waking up and you're trying to find a bathroom. Now the bathroom's moved because it's not where it was yesterday. Now you're trying to use your brain just like you're doing uh, a crossword puzzle, or you're trying to learn a new language, or you're you know, trying to do something that takes a little bit more brain power. Now you have to try to figure out, okay, I, the wall's that way, and there's a door over here, let's open up the door, there's the bathroom, okay, now I'm going to go to the bathroom. Maybe you might get frustrated from time to time, but at the same time, you had the memory of seeing the London Bridge. And that takes away from that frustration that you might have had. And so you have uh, memories that are going to long term, something that is new that, go, that helps with your frustration. You know, there's nothing worse than waking up and trying to find your keys and you walk around the house all day long. And that's what happens. You know, your partner's gone off to work. You're trying to find a pencil or your keys. And all you do all day is try to find that item. So as I put earlier, is that we've taken this as a team effort, me and her together, 24 by 7, and I'm there to help her, guide her from whatever she needs at the time. And then also, the last aspect is that running is in her reserve. So you hear people all the time that were singers and were able to still sing, people who are writers still able to still, still write. For her, it's running and exercise, swimming and biking. So we're building upon that. We go out and we do races all over the world. And right now, we, we finished up a race uh, last week in uh, Indiana. And we're going to do another race in South Dakota here in two weeks. So we just take it one time at a day at a time and enjoy life to the fullest along the way. We both know, I know from the book that you, You've done the research, but exercise definitely helps maintain neurons or build new ones, which I'm sure what you guys are doing is helping her brain build new neurons. I really wish it wasn't so hard to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that what your research is that? Well, is that one of the other reasons that you maintained this or I mean, I, don't, I oh, just I'm I, OK, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. I've done uh, quite a bit of research on this, and it turns out that, you know, you have people who get their 10,000 steps, and that's good, but they say that you're really supposed to get 45, 30 to 45 minutes of exercise four to five days a week. You want to breathe hard, that gets the oxygen going in the brain. You want to sweat, that gets some of the toxins out, and you want to get your heart rate up. And also, it helps with the brain in terms of reducing inflammation. And the great part about it is it wears you out. So when it comes time for bedtime, you're ready to go to sleep. And we all know the research behind uh, getting a good night's sleep every night. I'm convinced that we're going to find out that modern life is not so great for us. Right. Screens like we're doing now through Zoom, you know, cell phones, TVs, being inside all the time, commuting. I think that's killing us. I really do. <laughs> Yeah. So, so as an example, when the COVID hit, and I know from our experience with COVID, you know, we couldn't travel as much. We couldn't see people as much. You know, socialization is also very important. And on a lot of the trips that we do, we are we're with a tour. So we're socializing with others. And I'm, you know, you have to have a partner just trying to make sure that you go out and socialize because a person afflicted with Alzheimer's wants to stay in, doesn't want to go out, doesn't want to be around others. And this way uh, we can combine all that. So when COVID hit, I, I saw a decline in her because of the fact that um, she wasn't able to, to socialize as much and get out and to do the things that we described. And as you know, there's been uh, uh, quite a bit talked about for people with Alzheimer's and how COVID has affected them. 
Yeah, one of the biggest mistakes I think we've made was once we realized that we weren't going to lock down for a couple weeks or a month, you know, it was like continuing. Today is uh, April 23rd and we're slowly emerging from our little COVID cocoons. But I think long term care homes, even people with family members that they're taking care of at home, whether a spouse or a parent or a grandparent, I think the biggest mistake we made was protecting them from COVID, which that was air quotes for the non-YouTube viewers, and killing them with isolation. Right. I I still participate in my Alzheimer's caregiver support group, and I should back up because Tony probably doesn't know this. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. I am personally convinced with my, you know, bubblegum machine MD degree. That my mom also had younger onset Alzheimer's because by the time she was officially diagnosed, she was 69 and a half. Mm -hmm. But at that point, even my 16 year old daughter was like, yep, whatever, tell us something we don't know. She was definitely mid, mid stage by the time she was diagnosed. So you back up three and a half years, four years to 65. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she also had younger onset Alzheimer's. And she passed away March 31st, 2020. So I did not have to deal with all the pandemic confusion right. and stress. And, and I'm, I, I'm convinced that she had a moment of clarity. She fell because she was getting very combative with the care staff. She fell, broke her leg. That was March 8th, passed away March 31st. I did see her, the, let's see, the... Well, I, she went back to the care home on the 12th. So I saw her the 12th, the 14th, and the 16th back at the care home. And then they were like, nope, nobody hey, was coming in. Right. They, they locked the doors to all of us. And they did call me on the 29th and they said, well, mom's not doing so great. We think she might, she might do well from a visit from you. I'm like, great. Cause you've regular listeners know from, and it's my, I record and release at weird times, so it's mm-hmm. probably not easy to track. But I was getting very concerned. She thought I was her best friend, and she was very late stage Alzheimer's. And I was afraid she would forget that I was the fun friend that took her out to the park and stuff, and that she would not trust me, and that we were just going to have nothing but problems. And so, because I've worked from home for over sixteen years now. And there was no place to go for the first two weeks of the pandemic. I I didn't go anywhere. I didn't. I went out and walked the dogs. That was it. And right. I got to like a week, and I'm like, okay, I've been home for a week. Eh, I'm not getting comfortable about this whole thing. Ten days. I'm like, I'm giving it till the end of this week. So it would have been 14 days. And then I'm calling the executive director, with whom I had a very good relationship. And I'm gonna. I'm t- just gonna tell. Them, coming in. You want me to climb through the window? You want me to come in like garbage bag over my head? How do you want me to do it? Because it's, it's going to happen. Right. Well, it didn't have to happen in that manner. They did let us in before she died. They let us in the day she died. So we were blessed in that way. But yes. her, her clarity came from the fact that by breaking her leg and being wheelchair bound, her care home price went up like 25 percent we wouldn't have been able to go out to the park and watch children i mean that's what she and i did we'd go to the park and watch kids with the pool the library wherever kids were we'd go watch them right (laughs) i always tell people we're like the creepy old lady stalking on the little kids (laughs) and then the whole thing with the vaccine because i had always said i'm not going to do anything to prolong this part of her life right because she would have murdered me but so I would have been no to the vaccine for mom, except that it would be yes for the vaccine for her to protect others. So that I'm glad I didn't have to deal with that decision. You know, my household is fully vaccinated. My we got one more that's got one shot to go. So we're we're close. Right. That's my almost son in law. They live down the street. So with all that said, I really think the care homes should have they should have like by July last year, they should have been figuring out something other than the window visits and the little PVC or plastic hugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. Right. Oh, every time I saw those, I just was like, wanted to scream. And I was so thankful I didn't have to deal with those. Yeah. But you said you did notice a decline. Do you, was it just subtle? Was it more? Well, dramatic? Cause that was the most fascinating thing. I'm like, 
Here they've started this journey that goes against the grain, and then COVID basically forced you guys to almost stop what you were doing. So I think you're you're you two are mostly hers, your own little research project, right? There. Yes, that's the truth. We actually were in we came off a cruise in the Caribbean oh in boy. February. And the plan was we were going to spend two weeks in St. Kitts. So we flew over to St. Kitts and then COVID hit. And they closed the borders in St. Kitts. They weren't letting any airplanes in or out. So we could not even leave. And that's when I first started noticing the decline because, you know, the restaurants were all closed and we couldn't go, you know, to grocery stores. We could go on certain days and they were closed down the entire island for two or three days at a time. So we were able to get out of there. And I thought, okay, we'll head back to the Louisville, Kentucky area where her family is and we'll be able to see family and everything will be fine. Except they said, nope, you need to quarantine. And you can't see us <laughs> for 14 days. So we sat in isolation in a hotel waiting oh. for the 14 days. And then it was, you can see us, but from afar with mask on and all that. And we that went on to about June. And then we just said, forget this. We're going back on the road. Yeah, so we started traveling again. And we've been traveling ever since from June of last year. Pretty much, uh, we would find places that would, would let us in with a test or let us in, you know, without a test. We've been to Aruba. We've been to Mexico. Uh, certain states would let us in if we tested on the way in. So we just did that. And we continued to race. We'd find small races in little out of the way towns and 50 of us would get together and run around a lake for, <laughs> for half a day. And that's what we would, what we do. And it gave her, you know, the satisfaction of being able to, to do what she loves to do, which is to run and to compete against others. Now, here's a, a big curveball question. And I did read how you guys got off of St. Kitts. That wasn't necessarily cheap or easy. Yeah. Uh, being a former pilot probably helped you a little bit in that endeavor, as I recall from the book. Yes. So in the, you said she's, you guys said, forget it. We're going back on the road. And do you think that it's doing what she loves, the socialization or the what? Let's see. How am I going to word this? We've got the exercise, doing what you love and the socialization is your entire life 24 seven, despite COVID, which I think is really super fascinating. Is it the combination of those three things or is it doing what she loves? What do you think is the like most important thing for her brain? Most important, I would say, is the exercise. From, from what I've read is that that's the thing they will keep you going, um, and they recommend it. But the exercise builds upon the other things that we do. So, for example, if we get out here and we were run around the same block every day, that, okay, we get to exercise, but by going to a different city, and going to the botanical garden there or going to uh, see some other folks that are like-minded and, you know, uh, exercise with them, the travel that's involved. And then the exercise also uh, wears out the individual so that they're more prone to sleep a good night's sleep. And that's one of the things I've heard and read so much about is trying to get your loved one to go to bed. And to sleep, you know, eight or nine hours. And I've never had a problem with Catherine uh, getting a good night's sleep because, you know, we're, we're going to go and do an hour, hour and a half of exercise. And we're going to, you know, find some place to eat. We, we normally order out and bring it back to the hotel and we have our dinner. And then we, you know, go to bed eight or nine o'clock and she gets her seven, eight hours of sleep and wakes up uh, refreshed and ready to go for the next day. And that's our plan. You know, we, we would plan out our day. So, okay, where are we going to run the day? What are we going to do today? And having something that she can look forward to. And then you have the satisfaction of being able to uh, achieve your goals. And that's also very important for an individual that's, you know, always um, trying to find something, you know, to, to help their, help their mind. Back to, you know, moving around in, in what you were referring to, 
I, I say that what we're doing is counterintuitive. But the joke that I tell her is that I'm always moving her cheese. Mm-hmm. Have you ever read that book? <laughs> Who mm-hmm. moved my cheese? And she's like, okay, where's the bathroom today? And you know, where are we today? And then after about three or four days, we, you know, we've seen the town, we've seen the gardens, we've seen what there is, and she's ready to go. Okay, where are we going next? Now, <laughs> the advantages that she has over others is that she grew up traveling. Traveling was not something out of the ordinary to her. And also, we started it very early on. So it became part of her routine is that, okay, we're packing up the bags. She sees me start packing up the bags and she knows that we're getting ready to go somewhere, somewhere different. And do you have like a clue what stage she's in? I would assume she's still kind of early, early days, even after six years. No, she's, pro- she's probably is more moderate. Really? Well, moderate, yeah. She- I refer to her as a sine wave uh, on decline. And, you know, some days she's better than other days, and some days she's worse than other days. It's never a straight line decline. You know, right now, today, she's doing really well. You know, we're going to um, meet up with some of her family members uh, after this call, and she's really looking forward to that. And then uh, on Sunday, we leave for Bloomington, Indiana, where her daughter lives and grandkids are. So we'll have a couple of visits there. And on the schedule after that, we come back to this area in Louisville. And on May 1st, which happens to be the Kentucky Derby falls on that day, something we planned out 11 years ago, we're going to be going to the Kentucky Derby on her birthday. So she's really, really looking forward to that. Oh, May 1st was my maternal grandfather's birthday. So it's a good day. Yes, it is. So for the listeners who have yet to experience this book, and it's, I, I had to read it as a PDF people, so pick it up and definitely read it because it's really interesting and will give you some good insight, especially for those of us that were caregivers that might have a family risk of, de- of dementia or Alzheimer's. You know, I started exercising. Oh, let's see, like 11 years ago, I, I was, I needed to lose a tremendous amount of weight because of the diabetes on my dad's side of the family. And I basically took care of that, cleaned up the way I eat and started doing more than just every other day or so walking the dogs. I have crappy knees. So sometimes walking, being overweight and walking the dogs across the pavement, my knees would hurt. So I would skip a day and this was all bad. So now I'm a cyclist. I have a Peloton, which has kept me from going nuts because I'm not going back to the gym. And our weather is getting to the point where I can get back out with the cycling group. So, but we did that throughout the pandemic as well. And I totally lost my train of thought, which I hate it when I do that. I go on a tangent. So. <laughs> well, I'll help you here for a second. Okay, I appreciate it. Yes. Part of my problem is I've also got a headache today. So. Yeah. So in the book, you know, I talk about us running marathons and half marathons, and we set goals for ourselves. Uh, As a matter of fact, uh, Catherine was able to finish up October of last year getting a marathon in all 50 states, which is quite an achievement for anyone, but especially for someone in her condition. And we were were able to do that in Rhode Island. And I I tell people- did you go around the state in Rhode Island for that marathon? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That is a, that is a true statement. We went up <laughs> the coast and down through you know the major <laughs> the major streets. That's but funny. I, I tell people all the time: you don't have to go and run a marathon or a half marathon. I, I suggest that you go out here and find the start off. Go out here and find a charity run. Let's just say it's for uh, leukemia. And you go out here and you sign up and you you say you're going to walk it. Okay, sign up and walk it. And you're going to walk, you know, 5K is 3.1 miles. And you walk 3.1 miles. And when a lady pulling her wagon with an oxygen tank in the back goes by you, you'll say, wait a second, I can do that. And we have seen people out here with in wheelchairs. We have seen people out here with one leg. Yes. We have seen people out here with no legs, yeah. you know, with, uh, you know, with the uh, prosthetics on running races and you just build upon it. You say, okay, next time 
I'm going to run half the 5K. And the next time you say, I'm going to run the whole thing. And once you get going, you will be surprised. Now, you know, if you have, you know, knee and joint pain, you know, maybe you need to take it a little bit easy. But at the same time, I remember one marathon where we were in New Orleans and I was running and doing the best I can. And I saw this guy race walking, went right by me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he was doing what he could do and I was trying to do what I could do. So just, you know, do what you can do. But I, but definitely the fresh air, the scenery, meeting the people that are out there just trying to do the best they can, you'll be amazed of, of what it does for you. Well, I've experienced it because, like I said, I'm a cyclist and, and I'm kind of laughing internally because obviously all of our cycling events got canceled last year. There is one that we like to do. It's in um, the end of the first week of September, which just happens to be around our anniversary. And you'll probably appreciate this because you will probably understand the slang. It is a, bi a charity bike ride for the Sonoma County Police Chaplains. And it's oh. called the Tour de Fuzz. Oh. And they roast <laughs> whole pigs. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a little, little bit of ironic cop slang there, but yep. it is yep. a fantastic ride. We actually did it one year after a big fire went through there. You, I'm in California, so right. like after. Well, I, I was telling we you. We, were, were you? we did the Napa de Sonoma the year after the fire. Yeah. Okay, well, there's, yeah. we seem yeah. to have them every year. This yeah. was, I don't think we've done it. We didn't do it 2019. This might have been 17 or 18. Yes, that's, um, that's right. Yeah. The school that we, the event starts and stops at had lost buildings. I mean, it was really interesting. There was, um, and I actually have um, in my studio here, one of my audio boxes, my sound, my soundproofing boxes is a picture of the hundred year old round barn that unfortunately got lost in one oh, of those last fires. Yeah. But today we get the notice, you know, that we're on the preferred advanced notice list for the tour de fuzz. My husband okay. came in the bathroom and he says, are we doing that this year? They normally it's totally booked by the end of March or middle of okay. March. So yeah. we're, quite a ways late for normal, but we're still not in normal times. And I said, I don't know, are we? You know, it's kind of like, it's very hard to plan ahead. Yep. And he says, well, I'll just make sure we're still on the list and we can decide when they release the ticket. So I'm really thinking we should do it because we haven't done one of those bike rides in forever. Our, our Rotary Club participates in one that helps support veterans and that hasn't happened for the last this year or last year. So yeah, we need to get back into those charity bike rides. Yep. How many miles is that? Um, the Tour de Fuzz, you can do a hundred miles, mm. you can do sixty-five miles or twenty-five miles. Wow. We've done wow. the twenty-five and the sixty-five. Yeah. We did sixty-five two years in a row and we shaved off like over an hour from the first Very sixty-five good. to the yeah, we were we were very happy with ourselves. Fueling yeah. up properly helps. Yes, it we does. We learned. And then um, the rotary ride for veterans is 50, 25, and 15 because it's more geared for families. Mm -hmm. And we have yet to do the 50, but part of it is up a very steep hill and going down. The road is not. It's very potholed. And ooh, ooh, yeah, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a fall hazard. So we've I, I crashed my bike five years ago. I'm not interested in putting myself in a position of doing that again. <laughs> yes, I had one of those also in my career. Yeah, <laughs> I no broke fun. my collarbone and I yep. cracked my helmet all the way through. Yep. For those people who think bike helmets are ugly, I want you to yep. think about if I had not had my helmet on, this podcast would not be happening. Well, there's a story in the book about <laughs> me having a bike wreck, so you have to read it. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to get the book when it comes out, not on PDF, although Tony yes. did tell me about a cool app. So tell us a couple of stories about the traveling and the racing you guys did pre-COVID when you got to go fun places like Europe. And I know there was one race that she outdid you, even though she was wearing a boot on her foot from a broken, broken yeah. foot. Yeah, broken ankle. We were on a cruise in uh, Tahiti and we were scheduled to do the Australian Outback. Um, a month later, 
So luckily for us, I picked for us to be in Papayate for a month while she recuperated. I pushed her around in a wheelchair and she pushed me around in a wheelchair to get her walking again. And I said, well, she's I did the marathon and she was going to do the marathon also, but that was out of the question. So she says, well, I got a boot on, I'll do the half, signed her up for the half. She gets out there and it's, it's in the outback, it's in the desert. It's, you know, sand, hard packed sand, and she had a cane and a boot and she went out and I figured that, you know, I would get finished and we would have to go back out and find her somewhere, you know, <laughs> falling over, trying to get back up in the cane. And I got to the finish and there she was, you know, she was all done. And I was like, how did you do that? She says, I just kept going. You know, she most of the time she was by herself, but, you know, she just she got to a point where it was a turn and the people pointed in the right direction and she just kept going. So, yeah, that was a, a fun time. And within three weeks after that, she was back to running again. So a total of about eight weeks of recuperation and she was back running because for her. It's compa No, you're not going to do it without me. That's how she <laughs> is. She says, no, that's not going to happen. And another. Another story has to do with uh, my fear of wild animals and her fear of being on boats in the water for long periods of time. So the plan was that we would go to Africa and I would get over my fear of, of wild animals. And we did a tour with a, uh, a really good running tour company, Marathon Tours and Travel there in the uh, in Massachusetts area. And we've done a number of trips with them. What they do is you t they take you and do a race, and then also you do a tour with them also. They'll give you a tour of the area. So we're in the Maasai area. We're watching the migration of the wildebeest. They come in from Tanzania to, to the Maasai area. And I'm out there watching wild animals. And someone whispered in my ear, said, Tori, don't worry. They don't eat jeeps. <laughs> you stay you stay in a jeep they'll look up they'll say i don't eat jeeps and you'll be fine but if you get out of a jeep then they go hmm that's a meal so luckily we didn't have that problem so i got over my fear of wild animals and then in turn we went down and we had to take a four-day excursion from ushuaia down to antarctica and it was four days in the ship up and down, up and down, up and down. And then we ran a half marathon on the continent of Antarctica. And so she, I got over my fear and she got over her fear of being out over uh, the water for, for that length of time. And we uh, finished up getting a at least a half marathon in all, on all seven continents. That's amazing. Yep. We did a bike ride. In 2016, it was called the Jamaican Reggae Ride. We did it for my 50th birthday, and we basically rode in a tour group across the island of Jamaica. Oh, my. Well, I did. My husband didn't quite make it, but he enjoyed, uh, he enjoyed being SAG on the bus. Okay. <laughs> he was the support crew. Yep, yep. And Gotta have he, support. And he had a blast, and he keeps threatening to go back, but he ordered a road bike in june of well july of last year of 2020 and we're still waiting for it to come <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> it was supposed to come in december which was like six and a half months and then it was supposed to be march and now it's supposed to be july it's like okay fine a year whoopee yep. you know he's a tall guy so it's not like you can just find that size right. frame yes easily yes. but you know he has a hybrid bike he'll be fine <laughs> it's yeah, like be fine. um so is there anything else? Well, the one question that popped into my mind, we know that eating properly is also important to the exercise and the sleeping and the socializing and doing what you love. How do you guys manage that eating out? Because I find that to be just a giant challenge. And we're going on a three-week road trip up the West Coast in this summer. So I could use some tips. So, so could the listeners, I'm sure. Yeah, we actually started off, we found a book, a brain game, brain grain. That's what it was. Oh, brain. And, okay. Yeah. And it was talking about the fact that you needed to uh, not eat the grains and to, there's a correlation between the gut and the brain. 
and to to, to try to, to do that. We started that for about a year and we gave up on that idea. It was just very, very difficult uh, to, to stay away from, from grains when you're out there on the road. And we didn't see any improvement. So we figured, you know, why bother? But for her, if I can find salmon and sweet potato fries, <laughs> she is very happy. So that's what we try to do. But yes, it is, it is a little bit difficult. Uh, we try to, I remember we were on a trip to Madagascar and it was tricky for everybody to, to, to eat. And she ate white rice. She just had a salad and white rice and salad and white rice and others on the trip got sick and she was perfectly fine. So we just try to stay bland when we, we get to places that are, you know, the food might be a bit exotic. My biggest challenge personally is I don't like any kind of fish. Ah. And we were supposed to go, my husband and I are both Rotarians, hence the Rotary uh. Ride for Veterans. Right. So last year, 2020, the International Convention was supposed to be in Hawaii. That didn't happen. This year was supposed to be in Taipei, and we were going to spend like a week and a half, two weeks in Japan. Mm -hmm. And my husband was in Japan when he was seven, so you know, just a few years ago. <laughs> and yeah, he's like, you know, there's a lot of fish in Japan. I'm like, yes, I'm aware of it. But they also have Kobe beef, so maybe, or Wagyu right. beef. And I'm like, so I'm like, We'll, we'll figure it out, but I might I might be the white rice and salad chick at the mm -hmm. buffet because there's there's been places that we've talked about going, and that's always kind of the gag is, well, what are you going to eat? I'm like, I don't know. I'll figure it out when I get there. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so some of my some of my upcoming travels should be interesting based on food. But you were talking about you didn't find improvement with omitting grains from the diet yeah, going gluten-free basically yeah. that was the there's a lot of literature on that and i we just didn't see it's kind of yeah. hard too you're trying different things and you say does this work does that work and it's the person's on you know declining anyhow so but uh the things that we've found to work really well for us is you know make sure you get plenty of sleep uh, exercise make sure that you do heat eat healthy you know, make sure you have salads and eat what you like. Make sure that you eat because that's the other thing is you'll find that folks will start losing a lot of weight and, and you have to be real careful of that. That's one of the things you have to pay really close attention to is their weight. Make sure they uh, maintain their a good, healthy weight. And then, you know, seeing new things and socializing. Those are the, the pillars that we, that we build upon and have, uh, been very beneficial for us as we move forward it sounds fantastic and like i said at the beginning that's why i wanted to talk to you guys or to you because you've gone against the grain literally yeah. and <laughs> i find with um endurance sports like marathons or bike races there is no way you can stay away from complex carbs All right you know you don't right. want the right. white starchy ones if you can avoid it um i think the bike the pro rice racers do eat white rice, but mm -hmm. they burn so many calories. That's not a comparison. Right. I find I have to eat lean to keep my weight at a reasonable, reasonable ish level. It's got to be, mm -hmm. you got to really, really watch the fat. And I think the fat might be part of the inflammation problem that right. a lot of us have. That's correct. But, you know, just the, the approach that you've taken with her health and just going against the, the norm, which I just, I love because I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I'm a rebel. <laughs> yes, I am too. Yes, I understand and that. It'll be interesting to see how well, how long she lives and how well based on what you guys have been doing. Hopefully well, it's a long time. Well, that's the point there is the how well is quality of life. You know, we don't know how long. Nobody knows how long, mm -mm. you know, they, they, Say they might find a cure at some point. I would like her to be around when that cure is found. And I would like her to be able to enjoy life between now and then or until the end. So that's what we're doing. We, we love to travel. We love to socialize. We love to, to run. And uh, we'll just continue doing that. Right now, since she's finished up all 50 states as a marathon, our goal now is to go back around and do all 50 states as half marathons. 
and we just did state number 30 uh, last week. <laughs> wow. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. So we're working at it, going back around. So you got a California one planned soon? Uh, we've already done uh, a half in uh, California. As a matter of fact, we did the Napa de Sonoma okay. uh, half marathon. We did that twice, as a matter of fact. We loved it. Yep. Yep. I'm sure so there are plenty a- of options. Oh, yes. There's <laughs> always. And There's- the, the races are coming back. You know, they they took a little bit of a pause there during, uh, we were in Carmel, Indiana, and there was 3,000 of us that we were socially distant with our mask on, you know, for the start of race. But as more people get vaccinated and, and things start to settle down, I think it'll get better and better. And for me, you know, talking about uh, being a pilot and knowing how the filtration systems work on airplanes, I feel very comfortable flying and i've always felt comfortable flying uh the way the the systems work and wearing a mask and everybody seems to comply and we you know knock on wood we haven't had any problems we've both been vaccinated since the first of february so we're we're good to go was the the um ventilation the air circulation on airplanes always good yes it has been and what they did we mostly fly on delta and what Delta did in the very beginning is they cut down the number of passengers. They took out the middle seats. You couldn't, you know, have somebody sitting right next to you. And then also they, they, uh, reduced it to 70% in the back and 50% in the front. They're going to open up the airplane here in May, uh, May 1st. So in the beginning, and then also the, the way the, the air filtration comes in, it comes in filtered, uh, through HEPA filters. Uh, through the top and then sucked out through the floorboards. And uh, as you know, or you might not know, is that there's never really been a uh, a problem with all types of diseases being contributed to uh, air travel because of the filtration systems. And what Delta did was they went ahead and uh, they increased the, the amount of time that or decreased the amount of time they actually changed the filters the HEPA filters and they did some testing and they say it's about as clean air as you will have in a, a covid ward so that's feel, helpful to know yep one, yep one of the reasons we opted for a road trip partly because you know i've been like <laughs> i've been in this one particular room for so mm-hmm. long <laughs> and we lost we lost my mom. We lost my favorite dog. Sorry. Sorry, Ribby. Um, and, um, and then my 103-year-old grandmother died. So in, uh, in 50, almost 54 weeks, wow. lost three, two humans and a very special dog. And I just have this very strange, like, I don't want to leave the dog's home, which is not <laughs> normally right. me. I mean, I'm very attached to the dogs, but not quite that much. And my husband... I think he suggested a road trip so that he could buy a bigger vehicle, which I'm uh, not really not super keen on. I drive a hybrid. We're talking about getting me an electric car. So I guess he thought it was okay if he just bought a bigger vehicle for himself. Um, and I'm excited about that because, you know, there's so much beauty on the West Coast that I oh, haven't yeah. seen in so long. But so the people who fly a lot that get colds, is that just because they're touching grimy stuff? Or is it they think it's from the airplane, but it's something else? Because you always hear about that. Well, it's very very good, and it's very interesting. So when we first started traveling, we were getting colds all the time. And so I ran into a buddy of mine and says, hey, you know, you you know, take those wipes, those Clorox wipes, those, you know, just wipe down everything. So we still do. And after about the first year, we get on the airplane, we wipe down our st- everything on the airplane. We get into the hotel. She wipes down the bathroom. I do everything else. And we've been doing it ever since, and we have not had any problems. So when we see, you know, people now wiping down everything, we just kind of chuckle to ourselves saying, that's what we had been doing for years without having any problems. But yes, you know, wipe down everything you're going to touch. That makes sense. That's good to know. Cause- yep. I'm getting a little closer to being ready to fly again, although it's been well, since September of 2019. Uh-huh. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, they bring they bring crews on between flights and they sanitize the aircraft. They they wipe them down, and you'll get a message for Delta saying your airplane's been clean and sanitized and ready to go. Uh, we stay mostly in Marriotts, and they come in 
and they make sure the room's clean. And as a matter of fact, they'll stagger the room. So person doesn't check out and somebody checked right back in. They, they sometimes they even uh, stagger floors they'll have on one day. So they'll have, you know, second and third floor and other days they'll have the first and fourth floor. So they've been doing a really good job and we haven't had any problems at all. You know, traveling. I find it, well, that's fascinating in itself. We could probably go on for a whole other hour about that. I find it very interesting that it's like our f- best friends, their daughter-in-law, 10-month-old granddaughter at the time, got sick from the daycare that the mom and the daughter were at, gave mm-hmm. it to their son. His So our best friend's father died from COVID. His uncle died from COVID. The three kids... Uh, they had they got COVID, but nobody died. They were young enough that they were okay. Nobody in my family has gotten sick. It's like the weirdest thing. It's like weird pockets, right? It, you know, right. it's and they've traveled, and mm. they you know they were around his dad, and it'd be like, mm, do yep. we want to visit with you people? I don't know. You guys might right. be carriers now. So it's but it's been very interesting. So do you think the um, they're going to continue with the increased filtration on the airplanes and the the cleaning strategies in hotels, or you think in a couple of years we'll just go back to the way it was? I have no way of knowing, but I will say this. Uh, the travel agency, tra- travel uh, companies need our business. And they do not need anybody to be able to point back to them and say, this is where we got sick. So they're going to make sure that they do what they need to do to make sure that their their customers stay healthy. Um, we've pretty much have um, tried different, three different brands. We use Hertz cars, we stay in Marriotts, and we fly on the Delta. And we've been, you know, very satisfied with what they've done so far in terms of keeping us healthy. So awesome. Well, see, now we've done a PSA for yes, safe yeah. traveling <laughs> <laughs> during COVID and beyond and, yeah. and how to keep your brain healthy with younger onset Alzheimer's. So everybody should definitely grab Tony's book. It is hot linked in the show notes that you can just click it and order it. I'm sure he would appreciate that. You can help fund Absolutely. His, his next world worldwide domination of the marathon scene. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us before I let you guys go? You said you're going to go visit some family, so don't want to hold yep. you up any longer. Nope. No, the only thing that I would like to add is that um, I'm not able to promote the fact that uh, I would be giving any funds to a any major corporations, but it is we are planning on um, donating a portion of the proceeds of the books to organizations that support Alzheimer's and their caregivers. So if you, not, not only will you be, you know, helping us, but you'll also be helping those that help folks with Alzheimer's by purchasing the book. Awesome. That sounds terrific. And I appreciate you spending an afternoon with me. Absolutely. I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.